Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. And we're going to finish up the Old Testament. As we get going, there are three questions we need to look at. So the first one is, are we waiting for the third temple? I brought this up on Wednesday, I guess. And so... This is gonna. Let's take this one piece at a time. First off, calling it the third temple is a little bit of a misname uh, because we don't actually know how many temples there are going to be. So uh, there could hypothetically be more than three. For instance, let's say um, let's say the there on the Temple Mount that, that mosque is torn down. Let's say they build a new temple. And that one is also destroyed, and then there's another temple after that. Well, then it would actually be the fourth temple. So we don't really know. <laughs> the Bible never says that there will only be three temples, so there's that. Um, but it seems like uh, the temple in question that people call the third temple is possibly, uh, see, there's, there's a lot of disagreement here, so I'm just throw out this idea. It has been suggested that maybe a more th th there could also be a later temple after the one in the end times uh, that is there during the millennial reign of Christ, uh, which obviously is, is a possibility as well. So um, the issue is that when you're looking at passages from the Bible where it talks about the end times, it mentions a temple at that time. So people come into this idea that that must mean that the temple is constructed before Jesus comes back. But that's not quite, th there's really not much in the Bible to validate the idea. So there, yes, there appears to be a, t a temple uh, during the time of the tribulation, but uh, that doesn't mean that the rapture can't happen until then. I'll give you a couple different examples. Assuming, so first off, it, you know, let, I'm not going to even say that. I'm going to say this. We are at this point assuming that it's going to be a literal temple, but there is... Let me say it like this. Here's a better way of saying this. So the Bible actually only says that, that the Antichrist and the abomination of desolation will happen there, but that just means that sometime between here and in the middle of the tribulation, there's going to be a temple. So hypothetically speaking... It could be built two years after the rapture, for instance, and everything would be fine. Uh, it, my main point in all this is just that we are not waiting for the third temple to be built in order for things to move forward um, in God's timeline. Maybe I made that a little bit too confusing and, and didn't really do a good job on that. Let's hope for that I get better on the second of these questions. Will Israel lose the land again? You see a lot of people posting online about um, God's promises concerning the nation of Israel and how... Uh, you know, they aren't going to lose their land again. But there really isn't a biblical warrant for that idea. Okay, so let me kind of just... There is a prophecy from the, from the prophet, Am prophet Amos, prophet Amos, which was in 760. That's important to remember that, okay, 760. That said that God would plant his people in the land and they would never again be removed from it. Well, once again, if you remember as we've been looking at it, Amos prophesied in 760 before Assyria conquered Israel and kicked them out of the land. Before Judah was conquered by Babylon and was kicked out of the land. He prophesied before that. So they were conquered, kicked out. Then they came back to the promised land, and then they were kicked out of the promised land again. So obviously, Amos was not prophesying about that time. They were returned from exile. And possibly he might not even be talking about it at this point. The, the, the thing that, pro that Amos was prophesying about is talking about later in the millennial reign of Christ when Israel is preserved through the tribulation and they are rooted in an, in an earthly kingdom. So that does not mean that this war that they're in right now is going to go well for them. They could lose very badly and they could lose their land, definitely. And that does not mean that God has failed any of his good promises because those promises are talking about at the time of the end. So keep that in mind. Uh, as far as Israel returning back to their promised land in 1940, that, that may have possibly been a part of the a part of the promise, but I don't think it's as big of a highlight as a lot of times people make it out to be um, nowadays. <clears throat> Go 
Okay, make sure I don't forget anything. Okay, and then the third question, which is one that we will not actually look at tonight, but I'm just bringing it up because it needs to be addressed in the future. Uh, why is Israel going to return to the sacrifices from Ezekiel? Why is that happening? So be aware of that, especially as you get closer to the book of Ezekiel when you're reading through the Bible this year. And, um, you know, really study that through and, and kind of write down some ideas that you have there. And uh, then when we have discussions about it in the future, you'll, ha you'll be locked and loaded. Moving on from there, the first of the prophets we're going to look at today is Haggai, or Haggai, <laughs> depending on how you pronounce it. Uh, he prophesied around 520. Um, it's not an exact science, but somewhere around the area. <laughs> um, pretty exact, though, because uh, it mentions during a certain king's reign of Persia, so we can kind of get it pretty exact. Uh, and he's prophesying to the ret returned Jews. Persia is, is, is the leader, and in an attempt to garner support, they figured out, hey, if we can get people to like us, they're not going to rebel against us. Uh, and also, they had this idea that they had to appease all the different gods from all the different peoples. Uh, and so they kind of instituted this whole coexisting thing to the empire. And uh, it worked fairly well for them. Uh, in fact, uh, really all the way up until Alexander the Great <laughs> kind of knocked their heads in. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it did definitely gain them some, some support from their uh, people that they, you know, were, on, were over. So in 539, the, the, the people were allowed to return from exile, but uh, but they had uh, the work had stopped on the temple they were building because of persecution, which is recorded in Ezra. And eventually, after the persecution had gone on, they they got kind of hurt, and that hurt eventually developed into apathy, and that was the problem, um, because then they didn't really weren't really interested in rebuilding the temple. They're just like, hey, we're here, we're just living here, we're just gonna mind our own business and let that be good enough. Uh, Darius the first was the king in Persia. Uh, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel was the governor, and Joshua the, was the high priest. I mention that because they're kind of important for some of the prophecies. Um, it, it does mention something that's kind of interesting in the book of Haggai, and that's uh, it mentions that, that the that the temple that they're building that its final glory is going to be better than its than its previous glory, and uh, that it's, there's going to be peace and all that. And I I think that we'd be remiss to not bring up that this is at least partially talking about Jesus who brought peace and was in that temple before it was destroyed. So, um, also it's worth me mentioning that that temple was outdone by God's people as a temple with the Holy Spirit. We, ha we have a greater uh, glory in us than the one um, than the temple had in and of itself. So, a main theme of Haggai is obviously the temple. He, he went to the people who were supposed to re be rebuilding, trying to shake them from the apathy, trying to encourage them onward, and um, trying to get them to build it. Mm, continuing on with building it, being clean in the temple. Okay, another uh, another theme uh, with there with the temple is he's talking about being clean with the temple, that their uh, immoral lifestyle wouldn't um, kind of contaminate the, the temple uh, towards the end of the book there. So so what what does it matter about Haggai? I think that there's really value in every book of the Bible. Um, sometimes some books are, are more overlooked than others. But uh, in Haggai, you get kind of get this idea that if you put God first, and he'll bless you for it. Not, not in the sense of like bribing God, but in the sense of when you genuinely put God first in your life and genuinely seek Him, He just has a way of, of things. Um, you're blessed for it. Um, obviously beyond what you can imagine or deserve, I should say, or think you deserve, whatever. Um, but that doesn't mean that there are no problems, obviously. But we oftentimes miss um, the glory that God brings, except in hindsight. You know, God will carry us through and uh, we just kind of, don't think too much of it until years later we look back and say, you know, well, God really, God really watched out for me with that time. Uh, so the second book that we're going to look at is Zechariah. Zechariah prophesied at the same time as Haggai, probably sometime once again around the 520s, maybe a afterwards, depending on how long he prophesied for. And obviously he, he was prophesying to the returned Jews just like Haggai did. Um, and it seems as though they knew each other. They prophesied at the same time, the same people in the same area with the same people. So I mean, it really seems like they knew each other. Uh, both of them are mentioned in the book of Ezra. And uh, his grandfather's Edo is mentioned in the book of Nehemiah uh, as one of the people who came back uh, and from the exile. 
So Zechariah has two sections. There's chapters 1 through 8, which most nobody denies that it came from Zechariah. But then you get to chapters 9 through 14, and there's a lot of discussion as to whether it was from Zechariah or not. Um, but most of the uh, argument about this is entirely speculative. It's like a good example is, well, the topics are different. I mean, I've preached about a lot of different topics, and I've only been here a year. So now imagine that this prophet is prophesying to Israel over the course of a number of years. Why should that make us think that it's a different person? Uh, the second thing is his vocabulary is different. Well, y- yes, but different topics require different vocabularies. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like if you're talking about one thing, you, you may not use this word, but if you're talking about something else, you might use that word. Uh, and then also there's the, there's the idea that maybe as he grew throughout the years, uh, his vocabulary changed as well. I mean, there's lots of different things there. Um, a, a third kind of thing that people say is it couldn't possibly be all by him because it, it mentions Greece, and so it would fit a lot better later, like 200 years later. Well, <laughs> that only makes sense if you're already assuming that the prophet was not divinely inspired. You know, it only makes sense if you're saying, no, God had nothing to do with this, so it had to only come by human reasoning. Otherwise, if he really was a prophet, yeah, it kind of does make sense. Not to mention that Greece was still uh, a player in the 500s. It just wasn't as big of a player as in the 300s. So, anyways, long story short, I don't really think that there's any reason to doubt that the whole book is from Zechariah. Um, I also would like to to remind at this time that most of the prophecies from the Bible have already been fulfilled at this point in time today. Um, Later, Zechariah, towards the end of the book, has a large uh, a large bit that has not been fulfilled yet. So, at the beginning of the book, he has a lot of stuff that that we saw fulfilled with Jesus' first coming, um, and then he has some other stuff in there that that we haven't yet seen. Um, but a lot of the other ones that we've looked at have been entirely fulfilled. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Zechariah does have a series of visions that are not always easy to discern their meaning. Even today, there's scholars who are stumped about this, and thousands of years later. Uh, so maybe some things that could help you is a Bible handbook can help. Um, just studying it a lot could help. Uh, but just give it time. Sometimes the greatest lessons to learn from the Bible are the things that are hardest to learn. So what, what does it matter that Zechariah is in there? Well, uh, Zechariah encouraged them to build the temple just like Haggai did, but also he pointed forward to the coming Messiah being very, very close, which is something that Haggai didn't do over the whole lot. Um, and we definitely see a lot of prophecies uh, fulfilled in Christ, uh, prophecies that Jesus in his birth, I'm going to say this and understand what I'm saying. Jesus in his birth had no control over. And what I mean by that is, how could you as a baby fulfill prophecies about yourself? So I mean, unless you were the person who was being prophesied about. It's just, there's so many different prophecies about Jesus that if, it was, if Jesus was nothing more than a human, it doesn't make sense how well they all came about and were fulfilled. So moving on to Joel. Joel happens about this, well, about this, a little bit later. Um, about 500 or so, maybe maybe a little later, maybe a little earlier. Uh, and it's to God's people, yes, obviously. It could have also been during King Josiah's reign, uh, some, let's see, hold on, 100 and, 100 and so years before. But that doesn't really fit as well. It, it fits a lot better if we're assuming it's after the exile. A plague of locusts had come, and... Uh, after it had come and kind of wrecked havoc, God sent Joel as a prophet to, t- to try to turn the people's heart back. And um, it, it's a very encouraging book because Joel, and I think this one might be one of the only prophets where this is recorded, God gives this, this, this uh, word of, of, of judgment coming, and the people actually listen. And then the prophet goes and, incur- and gives them God's answer. So it's, it's a very, um, very encouraging book in that aspect. So God, when God answered, he had uh, a fourfold promise, the re- restoration of the land, spiritual revival, uh, judgment on the unrepentant, and Judah's blessings and prominence uh, in the future. Uh, repentance is, is highlighted in the book, but the interesting thing is while Joel is talking about how, how they need to repent, he doesn't actually say what they need to repent from. He doesn't mention the sin, but he mentions that they need to repent, which is a really interesting thing because when you look at a lot, 
really all the other prophets, they talk about repent from this. You know, you're doing this. Repent from that. You know, like Micah and Malachi where they're talking about the, the big sins that they're doing and they really go to in depth about it. Or Jeremiah where he's saying, hey, you guys, <laughs> you're worshiping other gods. You're listening to false teachers. These are things you shouldn't be doing. But here in Joel, we don't really have any of that. Just, hey, repent. I guess the people just knew what they were doing. Uh, <laughs> uh, God promised a time of the Spirit given to all people consistently rather than only a few. And see, this is one of the big misunderstandings about the Holy Spirit from the Old Testament. There's this idea that the Holy Spirit was not given before Jesus went up to heaven, and that's not true. The Holy Spirit was given. It just wasn't given to all people. It was given to a few for a uh, limited time and specific purposes kind of stuff. So like King Saul, for instance, the Spirit came on him for who he was called to do, or Samson when the Spirit came on him to destroy the temple, or I guess it was, well, kind of temple, the, in, there in Philistia. Anyways, it doesn't really matter. Uh, either way, you go to, I'm saying that the Holy Spirit was poured out. Moses, um, the Spirit came on him and continued on him throughout the course of his 40 years of leading Israel, and then it was given to Joshua. It was given to Elijah, and then it was given to Elisha after him. I mean, all throughout the Old Testament, there were people being filled with the Holy Spirit. It just wasn't given to all flesh. And so when, what Jesus was talking about was he, he said, okay, it's for your benefit that I go, that you guys can all get the Holy Spirit. He wasn't saying that nobody had ever received the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit wouldn't come on a select few. He was saying it was going to be given to all um, who were under the new covenant, which was kind of the whole the new covenant had to be established for that to happen, and that's kind of what he was talking about. So anyways, uh, yes, absolutely, the Holy Spirit was, was a, a thing in the Old Testament. It's not a New Testament invention. So well, what does it matter about Joel? Well, punishment comes, but there is a way out in God. I think that's really one of the big things of Joel, and the way that God so raptly listens, and, has, and they have his attention um, when they do repent. Which takes us to the book of Obadiah, which is not to Israel or Judah. It's to Edom, um, the nation of Esau, uh, the people who um, came from Jacob's brother. Uh, so this is at about 500 or, or before. It could have actually been um, about a hundred, almost 100 years before uh, when Babylon was destroying Jerusalem. Um, because uh, what, what the situation was is when Babylon was coming in to destroy Judah, uh, Edom stuck their, stuck their nose in it, <laughs> and they helped Babylon, and they, they, they did everything possible to conspire against Judah. They actually stood by the byways waiting for the, for the exiles to run away so that they could catch them and snare them. Um, they, they, they helped sack. They, they did all kinds of stuff like that, and it just wasn't, wasn't really what God had in mind. He didn't really care... Uh, for a brother to fight with his uh, with his brother, <laughs> he wanted him to just kind of stay out of it. Obadiah himself could have been a person, or it could have also been a title, because Obadiah means uh, servant of God. So it, we don't know if it's a person or not, and there's not a whole lot of information given about this guy. Uh, but either way, the the, the prophecy is about the same, <laughs> however you look at it. Uh, Edom had treated Judah extremely bad while ba Babylon was conquering them, so they should, you know, they're going to deal with that. Here, God's going to deal with them for it. They, they should have butt out at the very least. You know, not helping is one thing, but they didn't just stay out of it. They did evil. So um, went out of the way to oppose and not help. Okay, all right, here we go. Uh, a lot of c uh, Edom's uh, cities were built in um, kind of like rocks on top of hills and stuff. Uh, Sela w is, is one that's mentioned here. Um, it was Edom's... Um, I don't think it was its capital. I think Basra was the capital. But either way, uh, it was on the top of a rock. And uh, one of the things that you hear in the book of Obadiah, it says, who's going to bring me down from, uh, from these heights? And it's, he's kind of playing on the imagery there, which doesn't mean a whole lot if you've never seen their cities. <laughs> but if you have seen their cities, they're like on these kind of hard-to-reach places with like these rock faces on them. Uh, and it would be very easy to be prideful about it. Like, nobody's going to come and get us from here. And uh, that's exactly the, the other kind of theme of the book is he's being so prideful while he, you know, attacks his brother. And uh, interesting, uh, Obadiah is the shortest Old Testament book. I believe the shortest New Testament book is Jude. No, probably Third John. Well, I don't know. I guess we'll find out when we get there. Uh, so what, what does it matter about Obadiah? Uh, 
well, God hadn't completely abandoned Israel even in the midst of them being punished. He didn't give Edom a free pass just because Judah was being punished. Instead, he remembered, and even though he was being rough with Judah, uh, he remembered what Edom had done and kept them accountable for it. Um, so God returns to us as we, um, as we earn. And what I mean by that is, is uh, he, remembers, he remembers sin. Um, he keeps tabs on the wrong done. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. Uh, also, there's a big theme of Obadiah constantly talking about, he doesn't say, he doesn't talk about like he's talking about two nations. All throughout the book, he talks about like he's talking to two brothers who are fighting against each other. Uh, and uh, there's the obvious theme that would be very hard to miss. Brothers should definitely make peace. I think one of the biggest, biggest problems that, that uh, oftentimes Christians have is um, going to war against their brothers. You know, um, it's just not, not, not really a great idea. We, we keep doing it, and we keep thinking it's going to work different, but it really doesn't, uh, which is why this morning I brought up the whole thing about if you're going to leave the church, do it with a good attitude. You just, you, you don't, if for the sake of yourself and for the future relationships you're going to have, don't, don't muddy the streams before you get out of them. I mean, just don't do that. So the next, uh, next one we're going to look at, the last of the prophetic books, Malachi. Now, Malachi is separated from all the other ones by about 50 or so years, 50 to 80 years. Uh, he prophesied in about 450 to 430, somewhere somewhere, somewhere in there, uh, to the nation of Judah. They had kind of, at this point, been more or less established. The, the temple has been rebuilt. The, the walls have uh, been rebuilt at this point. So there, things are going pretty well there. Um, it follows this kind of uh, singular um, pattern throughout the book where he says... Um, some along the lines of this, don't do this. And then they, then they say, but how have we done that? And he says, by doing this. So like, for instance, you are robbing God, every one of you. Oh, but how are we doing this? By doing this. And so he kind of does that with a couple different um, topics there. It just kind of follows that same pattern throughout the book. Uh, God's people, again, were lax and, and just kind of disregarding the law. And uh, it, <laughs> it's interesting how history plays itself out because Later, the Pharisees would go to the exact opposite extreme. And the Pharisees, the root of them was established from the time of the exile because they never wanted that to happen again. Uh, it took a couple hundred years for it to really form into something um, that you could even call an order. But uh, So the Pharisees came into, into the scene with, with a really good uh, goal, really good purpose. They were really trying to make sure we don't mess up and stay faithful to God. It was a really good good goal, and Jesus and, and them really um, didn't disagree on a whole lot of doctrine, uh, really at all. And um, you know, so they definitely had to have good good uh, end goals. There, there's a lot of things in common with Nehemiah and Ezra in in the prophet of Malachi. So it seems like it's possibly a, a similar time. Whether you want to push that to its full extent and say that he prophesied during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, or if it was uh, later, as as I'm. Um, suggesting. Um, e- either way, it's a very similar situation happening. Um, restricting the marriages, though, uh, is, is kind of a hot topic, especially from modern-day people who don't understand what it's getting at. Uh, it's not a thing about ethnicity and keeping the people pure. It, it was actually more of a thing about religious preservation, because um, as we read throughout the Bible, we find out that the, the, the majority of, of, not majority, but a large chunk of the people going astray from, from God was because they got in these relationships with people that they really had no business being in, and so they went and worshiped their gods. Uh, you see the kind of same pattern over and over again. And interesting enough, you see this exact same pattern happening in modern-day Christianity, where what do you call it? Missionary dating. That's what we call it. I'm going to date this person. It's going to work out. And I'm going to change them. Okay, A, no, you're not going to change them. They're going to change you. As Paul said, bad company corrupts good morals. But then B, um, this is just not a good biblical. And then there's always, whenever you try to tell somebody who this is, is doing it, they always say the exact same thing. Well, a friend's buddy's cousin of mine, it worked for them. Well, yeah, that's, it's always some extended person way far off in the distance. It's never you personally that it worked for, you know. I had a, uh, a family member um, who had a family member, so it was my extended family, um, who missionary dated somebody, and they got, well, they claimed to have gotten saved, but I don't know, I just don't, I don't know. It, it's none of my business, I guess, either way. Maybe they were saved. Who knows? By the way, they got onto a board at a church, 
and did a lot of very illegal things, <laughs> very, very illegal things. Uh, and then there was a huge power struggle. Um, eventually, there was, as there was a church split, and then they left and never repented of, of their immorality. And so I don't know if they were never saved or not, but I'm just saying that's just one of the better examples that I have of missionary dating. It's just not really the best course of action. <laughs> and I think that Paul makes it absolutely clear that we shouldn't um, be unequally yoked. Uh, for some reason, it seems like young people don't give enough concern and thought into the people that they get with. Oh, but I love them. Well, good for you. Feelings will pass. But in the meantime, you can't throw away your whole life for a person that you're attracted to. I mean, they're going to get ugly and fat, okay? You know that? <laughs> we all do. It happens to all of us. Maybe you should plan a little bit further in advance than that. So anyways, um, you aren't going to change your spouse, <laughs> though they oftentimes change you, missionary, dating, or otherwise. So many of the things uh, from the Old Testament don't carry the same promises for us today, uh, but they do still apply. This is something that where people get really, really confused about because they want to say, I'm standing on all the promises of God. That sounds right. But then, when they're reading the Bible, they don't actually do the legwork of, but how is this promise applying to me today? And so they just try to read it and go straight to applying it. But if you don't understand the context, it's not that the promise is not going to apply to you. It's not going to apply to you in a different way. Like that, 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 that promise from Chronicles where it says, if my people who are called by my name will will humble themselves and and then I'm going to heal the land. That's not a promise to America. Okay, that, that, that is a promise to God's people in Israel. Is there an application for that to, to, to us Christians today? Yes, to us Christians, but not to America. Okay, this is a very important point to make. Um, so, you know, people think this. If it doesn't directly apply to me today and to our nation today, then you're basically saying that the Old Testament has no value. And that's absolutely not true, not true at all. You can understand the context of something and understand, understand that the original promise was to a different group of people and then still say, hey, the Old Testament has a value. This is actually something we're going to look at on Wednesday night. Um, we've been looking at Hebrews, and we're going to take a break from Hebrews uh, and, and, and look at this for the entire evening. And if need be, we'll come back to it the week after if it is something that is prolonged. Um, the, the point of the Old Testament, how it still applies to us today and how it doesn't apply to us today, all that stuff. So uh, careless devotion to God isn't, isn't, really, isn't really devotion, you know. And I think that, and that that's hard to hear, even as Christians nowadays. But if you're trying to be devoted to God just by the things that you do, that's not really devotion. God wants the heart. And you see that happening in Malachi. These people are still doing things for God, quote-unquote, but it's careless. They're not actually putting thought into it. They're not doing it with their heart. They're just doing kind of this lip service thing. And it didn't work for God. He just wasn't wasn't really interested in that. And uh, this is something that even Isaiah had prophesied about, but I guess they hadn't listened. So what what does it matter about Malachi? Well, how you do something is infinitely more important than what you do. And this very much so still applies to us as Christians today. How you do something is infinitely more important than what you do. I mean, I can be the world's best preacher and not have a heart for God, and it's not going to work. You know, being a good public speaker (laughs) is not the same as, uh, you know, having a heart that's, that's after God. And uh, you look at King David, and he did a lot of things that were just kind of not real smart. But, uh, you know, uh, he was a man after God's heart. <laughs> and then Saul did some things that weren't as bad as what David did, and he was a man with a heart after God. So I think this is kind of important there. The last book that we need to look at um, is Lamentations, and we skipped over that. And the reason why is because of the placement of, in the Bible. So in the Hebrew Bible, Lamentations is not grouped with Jeremiah. It's grouped with, uh, with a group of writings called writings, actually, is what, they're, what, they're, what their thing is. It's not, it's not done under the prophets. It's done under writings. So for our English Bibles, it's going to be right next to Jeremiah. And I didn't really want to look at it like that because I wanted to focus on the prophets. So now let's look at Lament- Lamentations. Uh, it was probably w- written within a generation of Jerusalem's destruction, um, probably before the return. When you read it, it sounds very um, first person. If you've ever read a war account from somebody who was actually in World War II, you kind of know what I'm talking about. They ha- it has kind of that raw quality to it, and uh, it definitely has that here. Um, it's a very tragic book. It has the horrors of war, the humiliation of what the, what God's promised people 
went through, their exile, their loss. This is a really a traumatic time for them. Um, and so even though God destroyed them, though, throughout the book, um, you get this idea that, that the person, that the lamenter says that he was their only hope. So there's kind of this contradiction throughout the book. God, you've destroyed us completely. You're our only hope. And turning to the very one who brought the destruction and uh, just kind of this, that's kind of what I was talking about this morning when I was talking about the lunacy of faith. God has, has stricken us down, and yet that's the only person I have to turn to. And uh, it doesn't make sense. It does something you don't always have an answer for, but there it is. It, w- it has been largely assumed throughout history to have been written by Jeremiah, but there really is no proof that it was written by Jeremiah. There's no, like, firm thing where it says this is Jeremiah's lamentation. I personally think it was written by Jeremiah uh, because in Chronicles it mentions the way that he did write other laments. Uh, and th- you have in the Book of Lamentations a series of laments, so it would fit. Um, but once again, there's no, like, scientific data I have to present to you. Um, it, Jerusalem, uh, Jeremiah was there for Jerusalem's fall, so that would, that would fit. And it has similar tones and themes to the prophet Jeremiah, um, even to the point of it being, you know, weeping and, and, and that kind of stuff, which was kind of one of Jeremiah's uh, more, notab- more notable things. The book itself and its structure is filled with acrostics. Uh, if you remember what that is, uh, if you don't, I'll, I'll just kind of give you a real quick um, thing. It's where you go through the alphabet, uh, kind of like if it's a poem, so every, let's say every paragraph would start with the letter A and then B and then C, which, but it would be in, in Hebrew, so Aleph, Beth, Gamil, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so it would start with those different sections, and so sometimes when you're reading them, you think, well, this paragraph doesn't quite flow as well. It's like when you're reading Psalm 119, it does the exact same thing. It's broken up into, into acrostics. And so when you're reading through Psalm 119, it kind of seems like it's all over the place. Like, what's the theme of this of the psalm? And that's kind of sometimes what happens with Lamentations. Um, but uh, so every section starts with the starts with a Hebrew letter, except for chapter five, which is the only part of the book that is not an acrostic. If you have a newer translation like the CSB, it has a really cool thing where it breaks down and, and actually prints the word down: Aleph, Beth, Gamil. So you can see it as you're going, and you kind of kind of get the flow of it. Um, obviously, you're not going to get the full umph of it unless you're reading it in Hebrew. But I mean, who wants to do that? <laughs> so uh, okay. Um, obviously, we can relate to, the, relate to the book of Lamentations in, in our own suffering, but obviously and usually to a lesser degree. I mean, maybe those Christians uh, that were evacuated from Syria could have related to it a little bit more, but they, Syria never had a promise from God, so I, I feel like they couldn't even fully relate to it. And I think that that helps. The Bible oftentimes is a book of extremes, and it does that to help relate to us. So, for instance, Job, right? Job wasn't just righteous, he was very righteous. So that when you suffer and it, you didn't do anything to earn it, you can relate to him, even though he's going to be probably more than likely be more righteous than you and have lost more than you. Still, it's something you can relate to. Same thing happens in Lamentations. You can relate in your times of, of grief and, and mourning. You can relate to the book, but obviously to a lesser degree. Um, you really get the idea of crying out to God uh, from the book, and it obviously in- encourages that. I think sometimes we as Christians kind of make... Christianity kind of dull, <laughs> kind, of, kind of dull, you know what I mean? Um, where we're supposed to have this life and this newness, and we just don't really feel like that. <laughs> we're just kind of, oh, I'm kind of tired, it's just another Monday. Uh, and I think Lamentations kind of reminds us that it's okay to not be okay, it's okay to kind of bring that brokenness to God, and uh, it's, it's good for that. So um, I, I personally take the view that Lamentations is the collection of Jeremiah's lam- laments put together. I could be wrong. So what? Uh, what does it matter about Lamentations? Well, they got what they deserved, but it was tragic, extremely tragic. Um, and I think that the same thing happens to us. You know, just because somebody gets what they deserve doesn't mean it's not a tragedy. You know what I mean? Like, you can mess up and be in sin and get everything that you deserve. You know, you end up going to jail. You end up losing your family and get all the things. You reap what you sow. Yeah, but it's still a tragic thing. And... Uh, you know, it's never something to, I don't think it's ever a good idea that when you see a, a sinner or anybody, even a Christian, that, that's in the midst of their sin and their bitterness. And it's easy to look at them and see the things that they do and say, man, that's, you should probably stop being so stupid. But in Lamentations, I think it gives us a better view of maybe being a little bit more patient and not quite so shooting off our mouth towards somebody else's suffering, um, since we really don't, we aren't at that season in ourselves. So what happened was foundational to Israel changing. Um, I know it was a very bad thing, but there was good that was brought about through it. 
Um, so some of the good uh, is that Israel never again returned to the same level of idolatry that they had at that point. When they returned back from the exile, they, they never went back to that level again. They, they messed up still, absolutely, but never to the same level. Um, at the time, though, all punishment is dark. Whenever you're in a time of God disciplining you or life kind of rubbing you the wrong way, it, it's, it's always dark at the time, but God brings God brings things um, in the future. So uh, yeah, this year, as you're reading through this part of the Bible, I, I hope that you just take a few minutes, just kind of slow down and try to put yourself in the position of the Jews and the different places and kind of see and try to relate to how they felt. And I think that you'll get a lot more uh, from it. So this is the end of the Old Testament. Um, we're going to have one more what's in the Bible in person. And then um, there's going to be one last lesson after that. So two more lessons. Um, the last lesson will not be in person, but it will still be um, the last lesson. So it'll be next week, and then it's canceled for Mother's Day, and the week after Mother's Day will be the last of the What's in the Bible. We're going to cover the New Testament in two, um, two Sundays, and then we'll be done with this. And um, any questions specifically about the Bible, we can still look at, though, on Wednesday nights. So are there any questions about any of this stuff? Everybody good? If you decide that there is something that you'd want us to look at, maybe something you didn't understand or whatnot, uh, remember, you can always ask the questions in the question box, and they will be looked at on Wednesday nights. Um, obviously not for a couple of weeks since we're looking at hell. Uh, not looking at hell. We're looking at what hell is like. I don't really, we're not going to go to hell or anything. But we're discussing what hell is like for the next couple of weeks. So we won't be able to answer the questions within the next couple of weeks, but we will after that. So, okay. Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, help us to be hungry, hungry seekers of it and, and, and steadiers of it. That we would show ourselves approved. That, we'd, um, that the Holy Spirit would have something to bring to our minds uh, because it's hidden in our heart. And uh, that you would guide and direct our paths. And help us to help us to really keep our eyes focused on you. We love you, Lord. Amen.